I missed the earlier casting call for the Minnesota, for the Minnesota group. Um, yes. Do I, am I controlling this? I am controlling this. So welcome to Minneapolis. It's the city of lakes and parks, in case you weren't aware, which makes sense since we're in the state of 10,000 lakes. And I think my task today is to try to do the impossible in 20 minutes, which is to tell you something about design at the Walker as a designer, but I also operate as a curator, and they wanted me to talk to you about design in Minnesota. So we tried to fuse these two elements together. So wish me luck in this 20-minute uh, presentation. Let's see. Is it cute up here? This is the unofficial <laughs> welcome to Minnesota. <laughs> which there was a blizzard in South Dakota last week with three feet of snow, so you really lucked out with 72 degrees. It's always like this here. We just don't tell anyone, um, so they don't move here. They use that line in Seattle a lot, too. Um, so what I wanted to do was try to encapsulate what Walker Design is, um, and we, like the AIJ, are celebrating our um, anniversary in a, uh, about a year and a half. We'll be 75 years old. We're actually a little bit older than that, but we don't count the prehistory because we, we, we used to show like classical paintings and we don't show any of that stuff anymore. So we count it from when we became a modern and contemporary art center, and that was about 75 years ago. So I'm, I am going to show you 75 years of Walker design in three and a half minutes. Oh, is it going? Oh no, there's no sound. <laughs>
<laughs> Any questions? Any? No. <laughs> that only took like 20,000 days to render, by the way. <laughs> um, thanks to the team for doing that. Um, so the other part of what I was supposed to talk about is, of course, uh, design in Minnesota, of which, of course, Walker Design is a subset. Although, for people in Minnesota, I think Walker Design is this alien spaceship that landed from Europe and planted itself on Hennepin Avenue. But it really has been part of the design scene in Minnesota since uh, 1939, so uh, a great part of that. Um, this is not by the Walker. This is actually Aaron Draplin, who studied here in Minneapolis. Um, but this is his poster, Everything Minnesota. So this kind of gets you into the spirit of like going into the curatorial mode here of talking about how do you begin to talk about design in Minnesota. And I don't think Minnesota is, is particularly unique, but I thought it would be an interesting case study to develop um, because um, the, after that 75 years at the Walker, we've had amazing exhibitions, uh, lecture series, publications, graphics, all the material of, of design, except for one thing. We have never had a design collection, which is uh, very unusual for a museum not to have that. And so one of the opportunities that we're looking forward to is, is what if we did have a collection, what would we put in it? What would be part of it? And this has become part of the exercise. So besides making the video, we whipped together a website in the last six weeks about Minnesota design that we wanted to share with you. But why Minnesota? Well, there's a lot of Minnesotans that like to talk about themselves a lot, and so we need this external validation or interest to begin to take notice of what's happening. And around the year 2000, we started to get a lot of press coverage. There was ID Magazine's coverage of uh, design cities, global design cities, which included Minneapolis. There was a Metropolis uh, Magazine article called The United State of Design about Minnesota. Even Newsweek got into the fray with Minneapolis, a design city. Um, and of course, um, we have one of the largest AIG chapters, which is AIG Minnesota. And I love that poster, right? That's the snow angel, typographic snow angel they made. Um, so, um, but I wanted to talk, first talk a little bit about design in museums. Now, of course, this is not the Walker. This is the Metropolitan Museum in New York and talk a little bit about collections and what, what makes design, and when I say design, I mean design in all of its fields, architecture, product design, graphic design, fashion, et cetera. So architecture is a particular problem for museums because the real thing, of course, is in the world, and so very few museums collect buildings or structures. They often collect only models and drawings, so it's the process or the evidence of the final thing. An exception would be this, which is at the Met, um, as I said, but it's, of course, the Temple of Dendera in, from ancient Egypt. And so what's interesting here is just how out of context this particular artifact is sitting in the middle of Central Park. Um, in that vein, um, to give you a little taste of Minnesota design, this is an amazing uh, structure. This is in northern Minnesota. It's the Nana Buju Lodge, Club Lodge. And um, this has a really interesting history. It was a private, exclusive private club. Um, it had the misfortune of opening in October of 1929. And if you know your history, you'll realize that there was a depression <laughs> a few weeks later, um, which uh, sent the club into you know, financial crisis. But nevertheless, they did uh, spend uh, quite a bit of money to, to produce this. This is Antoine Coupe, who's a French uh, artist who painted, hand painted the dining hall. And this is what we call, we can't quite classify this as a curator. It's what we call a psychedelic Cray Indian motif. Um, but it really just the most stunning space. And I think trying to tie into conference themes, I think this is a good example of hand. <laughs> this is all crafted, it's visually stunning. Um, another problem for design collections are a lot of stuff is too big, which explains why you see a lot of similarly sized stuff in museum collections. Um, quite famously, Paolo Antonelli, who's the design curator at MoMA in New York, has been trying for years to accession or collect 
uh, a 747 aircraft. And this is a photograph of the first 747 landing in the United States. Um, she hasn't quite figured out all the wrinkles of this because, of course, they can't, it's not the Air and Space Museum. They can't just stick this in the, well, they probably could fit it in the new atrium <laughs> or part of it. But um, so they, you know, so how would you be able to put this into her collection? So she has a whole plan about how they would acquire this and it would fly, or it would be one specific plane and it would be flying around from airport to airport. But this is a great example of a lot of things are simply too big to fit into a traditional collection. In the case here in Minneapolis, that would be our Skyway system, which hopefully many of you will get to partake in. It's the world's uh, most extensive Skyway system. It occupies 70 city blocks, so it pretty much covers all of downtown. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have a really good wayfinding scheme, so if all of you budding entrepreneurs <laughs> who want to invent a good wayfinding system for the Skyway, that would be fantastic. And I think this is a great example of a uh, head. This is all strategy. They, they came up with the idea of skyways in Minneapolis because it wasn't for the cold, which you would think would be natural. That's a good reason why they still exist. But it was actually because they started in the 60s when uh, shopping malls became a threat, enclosed shopping malls, which Minnesota has the first shopping mall, enclosed shopping mall in the country. So all the retailers that were downtown wanted to create a similar self-contained environment. So they linked together all the retail stores in the beginning. Again, uh, back at MoMA, the uh, recent acquisition, um, this was a personal head scratcher for me as a graphic designer because they announced very um, grandly that they, uh, MoMA had acquired the at symbol. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, my first reaction was, well, what font did they collect? Because to me, it's a character in a font, you know, and the font is a specific visual representation of a character. But they just acquired the at symbol, of course, because of email in particular, the significance culturally. And they render it in whatever font. They just happened to pick this one. So I think this is a good example of some design is simply, you know, too immaterial. Like, what, what part of it would you collect? I think the Coleroy here in Minnesota is this image, which is, this is the Spark Lab at the Center of Inno for Innovation at the Mayo Clinic, which is in Rochester, Minnesota. And it's a really interesting, um, it's like an incubator uh, laboratory housed within this healthcare environment. And they're dedicated to providing, improving the health delivery system and experience for uh, healthcare workers, families, and patients. And I think for me, this one is an example of both head uh, strategic design thinking and heart, of course, because of the overall mission to improve experience for people. And um, the most recent kind of buzzed about design acquisition by museums, this is from the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York acquired this project, which is an app called Planetary. And it's a visualization um, app for your music collection. So here the metaphor is that the sun is the artist, and then the planets are albums, and then the moons are songs, if you get the idea. <laughs> and what's interesting about this, and this is the problem with a lot of digital design, is its uh, lifespan. Like when you co collect an object, you're supposed to take care of it forever. And this is a particular problem, right, with digital apps and with websites in particular. And so they've actually come up with something rather ingenious, which is that they've taken, they've made the source code for this app available, almost like an open source platform. So people could, in theory, keep it alive. And so it requires the community at large to keep it alive, not just the museum. But for a lot of traditional museum collections, this is simply too ephemeral. And so is this. <laughs> Uh, ephemeral in the sense of perishable. These are Honeycrisp apples, and these were, and, and people don't think about food being designed, but of course it is, and we think about that a lot in Minnesota because we have, we have a, a large uh, deep agricultural history, but a large uh, agricultural processing history. This used to be called Mill City because of companies like Pillsbury and General Mills. So it was about processing wheat to make it into flour. And then later they discovered they need to start packaging this stuff in order to sell it as a consumable product to large numbers of people. So the same idea transferred to the idea of apples. So the University of Minnesota is known as a big uh, cult uh, cultivator of new apple species. So the Honeycrisp was designed to be both tart and sweet. Um, to have an incredibly long shelf life, so it looked great, and it could be stored in uh, supermarkets for a longer time. 
um, and also would have that particular uh, crisp texture because the worst thing is eating like a mealy apple. Right? And this took like 30 years of development to get to this point. It was almost abandoned. But this would be a great example of, I think, strategic thinking about how to position a product in the marketplace. I consider it to be heart healthy, right? It's an apple. <laughs> and, um, and also this idea of the hand in terms of cultivation. So a lot of food design happens here in Minnesota. So I wanted to switch over. So sorry, I'm running this from my own laptop and show you. Oops. Oops. <laughs> I'm late. Uh, let's see. I'm going to bring up a website that we've made. Um, so this is the Walker Virtual Design Collection. And by a virtual design collection, I wanted to explore the idea about what kinds of things could you have in it that you couldn't have in a normal collection. So we have, um, so this is the view all, and it's sortable, so I'm just gonna scroll down. So we have, you know, fairly famous things like the Aeron Chair, um, Betty Crocker, right, branding, the CSA Archive, the very cool Cray One supercomputer, this is the seating element, believe it or not. This was the world's fastest supercomputer, the first supercomputer in 1976. And it ran so hot that it needed its own air conditioning system. So the air conditioning system wraps around the, ba around the base of the computer, which is like a tower. But it's so big, it's like the biggest of, you know, a room. So they made it into a seating element. So it's kind of brilliant, I think. Of course, we have our share of architecture and products. We're also rather known for the uh, Art Instruction School. The Draw Me series is based here. Uh, Duluth Pack, the Fauché Tower. So there's a good mix, and I think, in here of graphic design, architecture, food design, um, branding, et cetera. And then I'll scroll back up here so I can sort these. So they're sortable by uh, genre. Or they should be sortable by genre. Oh, there it goes. It's trying to catch up now. So the, um, the idea of branding, for example. So we just want to take a little tour around here. I also added these elements in so that we could tag things. So here's the hearts, or the heads, sorry. And then the heart categories. And oftentimes, of course, design isn't just one thing or the other. And then the hand. Um, but if we go into a little bit deeper dive into some of these, um, some of these items, this, for example, in their architecture, um, the world's quietest room is in Minneapolis. You probably didn't know that. It's so quiet that it's quite disconcerting for visitors. So no one's really survived in it for longer than about 30 minutes. Um, because it's, a, it's a, called an anechoic chamber, so there's no echoing inside the room. And it's uh, minus 9.4 decibels. And the average conversation is about 60 decibels. And it's used to actually test products. So they talk about things like the sound that your phone, dis your smartphone display makes. Not the alarm or not the call, but just the sound of the electronic circuitry they can measure inside of it. Um, let's see. Uh, this is another fantastic one. This is the Winter Carnival Ice Palace in St. Paul, our sister city. These were started in the late 1800s, in 1886, because some damn journalist from New York came through town and said um, on the front page of the New York paper, um, Minnesota, another Siberian wasteland. <laughs> And this riled the locals up, and so they said that we're damn it, we're going to make a, a winter carnival, and we're going to build an ice palace. So this thing is over 100 feet high, and it's composed of 20,000 ice blocks that were carved from local lakes. And you can see they have all these fun and games in front of it. So this is very typical Minnesota, where you're supposed to laugh and be fun. You're supposed to be just a okay with the weather, <laughs> no matter how cold it gets. Um, and then there's like the oddities, like Frank Lloyd Wright's only gas station is, <laughs> is on the way to Duluth in Cloquet. Um, and the owner of the gas station, actually, he, Wright designed his house, his personal residence, and then he hired him to do the gas station. And Wright had a model for a gas station as part of Broadacre City, but Broadacre City was never built. It was sort of like his utopian scheme for suburbia. But if you're in the market, both the gas station and the house are up for sale. 
And because it's cloquet, you can get it for like real cheap. <laughs> so, and then there's, um, as I was saying, there's a lot of strange categories too. We talked a little bit about food design with the, the Honeycrisp apple. Um, also, of course, uh, spam. This is, <laughs> I found this on the internet. It was really interesting in their corporate history. They're not sure how spam came, those words came, came together. And then one of the theories was that it could be a contraction of spiced ham. And then I found this ancient can of spam. And so I think it is pretty much that's the case. So that's in Austin, Minnesota. And there's actually a museum of spam you can go to. And one of the things that was really interesting in doing this research is that Minnesota is apparently the hotbed of game design, like analog game design. And one guy in particular, Ryan Geyer, whose father had a design firm in St. Paul, invented, first he invented Twister, um, which was originally called Pretzel. Um, he developed this for a shoe polish client and I'm not sure exactly how that all fit together, but two other guys at the firm, he kind of had this idea for this mat with these colored dots on it. And so he had this, his friends there kind of brainstorm different approaches for making a game. And one of the games they came up with was called Pretzel. And they sold this to Milton Bradley. And they changed the name to Twister. Of course, they changed the name. But this, this was a product that was never supposed to be because even, the, and they had a great fun with it, but um, uh, Sears um, objected because you would have like, you know, well at that point men and women convorting in close proximity on the, <laughs> in the same space and time. They didn't seem to care about two guys on the map, but. <laughs> <laughs> but through some fate, the, the PR director never got word that the project was canceled, so Sears refused to, to, uh, to buy or to sell them. So this canned the project essentially, but they forgot to tell the PR guy. And the PR guy had booked this episode where Ava Gabor would show up on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and they would play Twister and they forgot that was gonna happen and it happened. And of course, overnight, there was such demand for this game that they had to go forward with it. And lightning does strike twice because the same guy invented Nerf. <laughs> and he invented Nerf because he was trying to invent another game which involved cavemen, foam rocks, and money hidden underneath them. <laughs> I have no idea how that game, what the rule set was for that game. But he noticed that at, at the break time that one of the cavemen players was trying to shoot a basket with one of the foam rocks. And so he got this idea of, of having this ball. And so it's, it was billed as the first indoor ball. So of course it wouldn't break lamps. You could throw it, it wouldn't break windows. And now it's a multi-billion dollar platform. Um, this was originally for Parker Brothers. Um, also water skiing invented here in Minnesota and rollerblading. And these come out of winter sports, right? So that, you know, water skiing was developed because they wanted to have the same kind of experience on water that you would on snow for cross-country skiing here, since we don't have too many uh, mountains. And then rollerblading was for the same reason, was for off-season hockey training. And uh, they didn't invent rollerblading, but he massively improved it and created the rollerblade brand. So this is really inline skating. And magnetic poetry. So it's kind of a windfall in the game area. Whoops. Oh no, I did the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Oh, good, we're back. So um, other like challenges would be landscape design, which often is not collected by museums because it, of course, has a specific context. And um, one example here would be the, the amazing Indian burial mounds along the Mississippi River, um, which were largely destroyed, sadly, by Sunday amateur archeologists um, in the early 20th century, but there are a few that still remain. Um, so these would be examples of man-made creations. So I think I'm going to jump, oh, service design. We're also a hotbed for service design. I mentioned the Spark Lab at the Mayo Clinic, but we also, of course, um, began Geek Squad, which was, uh, um, which was purchased by Best Buy as a service for technology-related uh, goods. And um, this funny enterprise, which is a franchising opportunity, it's called Tank Goodness. 
and I describe it as a cross between FTD and Domino's Pizza. But instead of delivering pies or flowers, they deliver fresh baked oatmeal chocolate chip cookies with a gallon of milk in these Mini Coopers, these branded Mini Coopers, and um, replace their Spunk design machine here, did their uh, thinking around um, that kind of experience and product. So I'm going to jump back out and try to get back to my presentation here. So we wanted this to be not only just a website, but also oops, try to do a manifestation of the um, of this idea so it would exist virtually but it could also be out in the world so we thought this would be really great as a kind of campaign being designers um, to kind of promote awareness about these design artifacts so you would have for example masking tape which was developed by 3m very important product um, the honeywell round thermostat was developed here maybe a billboard campaign maybe bus stops tram stops and then also maybe an app. And this is, um, we're showing here the possibility where you could do tours of the city and then using augmentation or augmented reality, you could show buildings that were no longer there and you could dive deeper into the history through the interface. So to wrap up, I think that Minnesota <clears throat> has this amazing rich history if you look in all the nooks and crannies and if you expand the definition of design which is already being expanded for us right in the world at large you will find lots of these examples and i think that's true across the country so one of the challenges is can can people take this kind of approach and can we begin to build a 50 state collection of design to represent completely the united states so i'll just leave you with um, a parting thought from the other big export from Minnesota, which is um, Prairie Home Companion and Garrison Keeler. And if you listen, you'll know that there's a long running skit about Lake Wobegon that I'll append for Minnesota. So I think the state of Minnesota offers um, a place where all the designers are strong, all the work is good looking, and all the clients are above average. Thank you. I mean, I talked before, I mentioned before about how, as a person from elsewhere in the Midwest, I always looked up to Minneapolis as this epicenter of things like design. Is, wh wh why is it that this city, and as you've now explained, this state, in a way, punches above its weight in these ways? Is it, as, as I was taught as a kid, uh, because of this progressive corporate culture that prizes design and art? Uh, yeah, no, it's something that it's, I asked the same question when I came here. Well, after living here for uh, probably five or six years and trying to figure it out, um, I think one of the things is because it is so fucking cold. So, <laughs> so we have lots of spare time now. <laughs> We're locked in the cabin and we, we have to make design. No, it's, uh, it's, it, there's a group of civic leaders in the 1940s and 1950s who got together and who were kind of like the Richard Floridas of their day. And they realized that in order, to, in order for people to want to like, you know, to make the place attractive to people, they had to invest in the community and in the society and the culture. So there was a great deal of investment and money that went into education, into culture. Culture was really important because like, okay, why would you want to move where it's 20 below out? And so there was a whole movement that started here in Minnesota, which was the 5% Club. And so Target is the contemporary manifestation of that kind of give back. And so one of the, the old chairman of Target used to go around to every new company in town, he would go visit the boss and, and, and tell them like, well, this is how we do it in Minnesota. So you were expected to give 5% of your, you know, your profits back to the community. And so that created this whole um, expectation that went on you know, for decades and it's still here. So we, have, we live in one of the greatest philanthropic communities in the country. And I think that has fostered a lot of Fortune 500 companies here. I think we rank third in the number of Fortune 500 companies. But it's a complete ecosystem here. That's what's so weird. It's like huge corporate in-house firms, small boutique 
design firms, um, private schools, public schools with really good design programs. So it's that mix, it's that weird, it's the magic chemistry of the ecosystem that works at all scales that I think it makes it and an interesting become, place. And became at some point a virtuous cycle that just kept going. This yeah. is what you had to do if you were a rich person or a corporation, and right. that brings more people here and exactly. it all worked out. Exactly, yeah. And if global warming uh, really takes hold, then you're not gonna even, there's gonna be no reason not to live in Minneapolis. That's right, and you know um, that you know, we're, we're one of the biggest states affected by it, by Wisconsin and Minnesota. You did this wonderful virtual um, design museum in Minnesota that you showed, and of course it's essential to work in digital realms if you're running a big chunk of a big museum as you are, but as a museum guy, do you worry about the virtual versus the real and, and, and people thinking, oh, I can just go to a website and look at this stuff, and that's the same as seeing these things, which it isn't? Right. But, you know, like, funny following Eric Baker, right? I mean, this is the museum without walls that um, Andre Malro thought about in the 1940s. His idea was that, and if you think about if you ever had art history class, how many of the paintings did you actually see? We know the stuff through representations, and we know the stuff through images. So we've been living with this problem of the real thing versus, like, the image. But now, of course, they're almost synonymous. I still think there's a lot of value in seeing the real thing because there's nothing more high def than real life. <laughs> and it's not, I mean, I would argue in many cases, it's not just a difference in degree like high def, it's a difference in kind by yeah. seeing the thing and staring at it and maybe even touching it, right? Right, and you would have different, you would have different goals, right? So like when you see the collection together, you start thinking, well, are Apple's design? I never thought that someone designed that, but they did, and they didn't just do the marketing. They did the product. It's like a product, and so that was a kind of a small revelation, a revelation to myself. I mean, I kind of always thought of food design as being this crazy new frontier, along with scent design and all these, you know, <laughs> other areas that we that we hear about at conferences, but no one's quite sure who who does that kind of work. But it's all being done. It's all being designed. That's the amazing thing. Now, as uh, the design curator of the Walker and the guy in charge of all of its public presentation, those seem like jobs that could either inform themselves and, oh, you're a better curator because you know what the people want, and, oh, you're better at dealing with people because you really know this stuff. I can also imagine that they would clash. Do they? Uh, the, the idea of curation and dealing with the I mean, which hat are you wearing? I mean, I, it must be confusing about, oh God, yeah. do I have to worry about increasing attendance or can I just do the cool show I want to do? Yeah, and so finding the sweet spot, right? So a lot of my thinking is like, can we do the cool show? Can the cool, sh I think I'm one of those people that believes you can have it all. Like the design that we produce at the Walker, it's got to be smart, it's got to look good, and it's got to perform. And why not all three things, right? There's this cliche that goes through architecture like cost and time and money, you can have two. It's like, no, I want all three. <laughs> and I think that's the same kind of attitude we bring to thinking about exhibitions. Not every exhibition has to be like a big blockbuster, but it's the balance of those things. Because if, I, if, if, what, if I'm doing a big show, we can also um, show a, a really cutting edge young artist that doesn't have the name recognition. And that world balances when you, when you can do it, when you can do it that way. But there are many museums, I would venture to say probably most, where there is an inherent tension, not necessarily bad, but a tension between the curatorial people and the people in charge for, you know, getting yeah, people I mean. in the door. <laughs> um, as a member of both tribes, do, do, does both, do both tribes trust you or do both tribes, are they suspicious of you? Uh, they might be suspicious of me, but they don't tell me that. I'm kind of an interloper between both, like a, uh, interloper is maybe the wrong word, like the tr early tr idea of translators, like when you first contact, you have to make contact with the other tribe and you can't, don't speak their language, so you need an intermediary. And so I'm often translating both back and forth, like the specific curatorial intentions and don't corrupt them too much on the design side or on the marketing side. And then from the reverse thing saying, well, you know, no one's really gonna understand this. You gotta change the language, you gotta do that. So it's constantly back and forth. And finally and quickly, is the, in, in my experience, the, what, the stereotype of Minnesotans of this extreme niceness is one of those true stereotypes. A, is it, and B, does that make your job easier or harder when you're doing edgy, weird, 
transgressive design shows, say. <laughs> well, in Minnesota, the, 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 the neutral com compliment is, that's interesting. <laughs> and so I just accept that as being a positive, um, <laughs> a positive value that they would, you know, put, bring forth to the table. But the Minnesota nice thing is so true because um, I, being a new transplant, I heard this from a lot of designers that come here, and they're always struck, this is particularly true, I think, in the graphic design community, um, that um, they came to town and people met with them, and they actually tried to help them out and give them clients. And they were like, that doesn't fucking happen in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's really cutthroat. But it, so for my experience, it has been that. It's been very nice. Andrew Blavo, thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for having us. Sure.